Born in Blood is a, a project that has basically consumed the better part of the last two or three years for me. It's been the, uh, the thing I've been working on most consistently um, for that period of time since the publication of Strange Playgrounds, really. Um, it kind of grew out of Strange Playgrounds in its own odd way. It's been very... I hesitate to use the term because it's so cliche and it's so uh, poorly used generally, but in a very organic, natural way. Um, it came as a result of my interactions with the photographer Nick Hardy, who offered to do some promotional photographs for Strange Playgrounds, which are absolutely stunning. I turn. The light loves me, the shade even more. They play and pool, flutter over me, only their touch worthy. So many others, begging the same with their scented letters, poems, pictures. One, he sends me photographs of mutilation, his tongue, his neck, his genitals, sometimes sequences, playing like broken films across the plastic, beyond it, every slice, every spurt, moan and scream. Others send me packets of their blood, shed hair and scraped off skin. One, a pair of lips, an eyeball, a pierced tongue. I had them preserved, set in crystal, so that I could admire them and count myself blessed, beautiful enough to warrant such sacrifices. I never touched them, never let them touch me. Only the light, the shadow, not even the ones who made me know it, not since the first spurts that made me what I am. Maybe I will. When the towers fall, when worship stops, when the cries and prayers from below my balcony fall silent, until then I can look, step out into the air, see myself painted and reframed in a thousand different configurations, strung throughout the city, every face a slice of my soul, some animated, snippets of motion stolen in time, some clothed, some nearly naked, a taste, an echo of some neon heaven. What if they saw me now? Saw me split, stretch, and peel. The discarded skins my eyeless ones come to clear away. Those who cannot see, cannot speak, having given up the capacity just to be near me. I make them eat it sometimes, coo at them, praise them for being brave, for being so good. They do it because they have nothing else. Everything, everything given. Children and lovers surrendered, lives abandoned. To be here near me to taste my sweat and breath on the air is enough for them if those outside could see the fingers easing beneath skin come loose the way it splits and trails and peels away would they love me then would they worship what's beneath no they never wanted that only the paint and masks the theatre so long as i'm beautiful they'll continue to sing and worship so long as the illusion sustains I might as well not be real at all, a painted doll, a hologram, but I am. The blood, the borrowed skin, stinking, rotten beneath, I am real. Maybe I'll show them, today or tomorrow. Maybe I'll walk out onto my balcony, truly naked, let them see the shit and rot they've made their goddess. Maybe some will even still love me, but they'll be of a different church. Not the ones who love light and plastic, the ones who walk in neon, who send me photographs of themselves painted and pierced and mutilating themselves. No. They'll be the ones already mutilated. The half-born things and living abortions, flushed down the drain before they can squeal their first breaths. The deformed, the derelict, the broken-minded. My true church, my children. As for the rest, the ones who think they know heaven in the glow of my billboards and holograms, who believe the lie of love my eyes tell from the pages of catalogues and fashion magazines, what if they saw me now? It's so, so beautiful. The images he created um, based on the short stories in Strange Playgrounds are phenomenal and inspiring in and of themselves. They sort of he has that unique quality that 
a lot of really great imagists or imaginers do, whereby they suggest wider narrative beyond the image somehow, beyond the frames of the image. You can looking at the the pictures, you s immediately start to put together back mythologies and narratives that are going on behind them or around them. It's it's like. He captures parts or isolated moments within stories that suggest wider narrative. It's it's a fabulous quality, um, and he produced so so many images, more than I even knew what to do with, to be quite frank. Um, and he came up with the the notion of maybe perhaps collaborating on something, on putting these images together with initially all he asked for were one or two sentences or paragraphs to go with each image um, but that didn't really uh, pan out as such but largely because of my own proclivities I went at the minute I started looking at the the, the huge array of images that he created and was still creating um, and started putting pen to paper it spiralled out of all control, and before I knew it, I had sheaths and piles and folders full of not just scraps and paragraphs and sentences, but whole short stories. Break it open, you idiot. Carve your own way. I've tried already a hundred times. I can't. Liar. You've never tried. Never once. Look! Look at my hands, my face. I've tried so many times. No. You tell yourself that because it makes you feel better. That you're worth more than this. Shut up, this stink. Shut up, this blood. Shut up, this life. Look. Look at the walls, the floor. You see that? That's you, my beloved, my sweet. What more can I do? Look at me! I don't want to. I know, remember. That was the deal. Together forever. Knowing what we know. Feeling what we feel. You can't lie to me like you do to yourself. I see, sweetheart. Oh yes, I see. Leave me alone. Giving up so soon? How sad. How pathetic. No wonder they left you here. They didn't. You know that. They all, what? Died? Did they really? I find the memory fuzzy, don't you? Stop. I don't remember. No. Of course you don't. You never wanted to. But I do. Remember Cecile? No. Shut up. Anything left of her around here? Maybe painted on the walls, strung from the ceiling? No? Hard to tell, isn't it? You lose so much when stripped down to your meat. Sex, race, species, nothing matters. Shut up! I can't, sweetheart. Not now. Not if we want to survive. I'm trying to help you, though fuck if you appreciate it. Help me! How? No one can help me, least of all you. I'm the only one. The only one who ever has or will. Now get up. No. Leave me alone. Get up, damn it. No. Fine. Then die here. Wait for them to come back. Wait for them to cut you apart. String you up with the rest. They all deserved it. Terrible, terrible people. So do you, sweetheart. No, I don't. I've been so good. You think that matters? After what you did? They don't care anyway. Innocence is meaningless, even if it were true. I thought you might have realised that by now. Let me sleep. I, I need to sleep. Fine. Sleep then, before they cut away your eyelids, rip out what's inside, before they put worms inside your head and cockroaches in your belly. You've seen. Don't pretend like you haven't. No. When they come for us. When they find us. No. I found you didn't I? Out in the wastes? If it wasn't for me, you'd be as lost and wretched as all the rest, eating your own dust and dreams. I never asked, never wanted it. Liar. I came because you called, because you wanted to remember. 
Christ, the stink of you. A nightmare. Wake me up. Mary's gone, and Daniela, and little Mikey. No one left. Only us. Let me help you. Let me save us. No. Or let me save myself. You don't care? Fine. Let me out. Let me live. I can't. Not after. Nothing like before. I promise. I didn't know back then. I couldn't see. You've helped me so much, sweetheart. Now let me help you. They're coming. I can hear them. So am I. Can you hear that? Their blades on the walls. You want to feel them inside of you? You want them in your guts, under your skin? You saw. We saw what they did to the rest. Cochrane, Mellows, Verity. I know. I know. So let me out. Let me save us both. All right. All right, I will. I don't care anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much, sweetheart. They come. Machines in the walls, whirring, whining. Rusted wheels, sputtering circuits. The cell door, grinding open. Time was, my friend, the one whose skin I wear, would have cowered away, terrified. Not anymore. Oh, he screams. Constantly. But not because of them. What can they do? Only what flesh and thought can endure. I... I've shown him things in these brief few moments, things that he thought were nothing but dark dreams, that I've done while he slept and whimpered in the depths of our shared skull, things that even our jailers have never seen or dreamed of. A stink, leather and sweat, meat and powdered bone, sweeteners layered synthetically over the fowl, as though they bathe in vanilla. One of the grunting, pig-squealing things, sloping through the doors, its skin pierced by various hooks and ringlets, threaded with chains and fine silver thorns, its swollen belly and pendulous breasts naked, as though to sport its mutilations. The mask it wears resembles something from a BDSM club, specialising in Halloween themes, leather, almost featureless, save for ragged holes at eyes and mouth, both bloody. A clutch of rusted metal shards protruding from the left eye. A bizarre flower, pieced together from the ruined and discarded. In the meaty swollen masses of its fists, the flesh seemingly melted and fused as though held in flame until meat and metal became one. A meat hook. Some sort of cleaver. But butcher's implements or surgeons. Vast. A man mountain. Its blubber barely contained by skin stretched to bursting. By the leather wrapped around and woven throughout. Disgusting. Not the sight of it, nor the stink. The air around it. Seething. A deeper corruption. Something that only another living nightmare might appreciate. Two others enter after, decked out in white so absurdly pure as to be almost luminous. Surgical or priestly gowns, maybe both, trailing across the clotted, gore-strewn grating as they drift, carried on strange currents like jellyfish, their bodies stretching and distorting as though not entirely real. Knives strung from their belts, instruments glinting in place of fingers, syringes, scalpels, drills and saws, their faces masked like the other, like everything in this place, white ragged cloth, bloody around the mouth and eyes. They part as they enter, peeling away from one another to observe their work. I watch, the pig squealing butcher hacking and slicing the air, at the quivering, shapeless masses of meat strung from the ceiling, the ones I share this cell with, my fellow naked and brutalised, quivering away, pressing themselves against the steel walls, not caring if they rasp or snare on the jagged tongues of metal that protrude, the shards of glass, hooks and drill bits blossoming from them like fungi. It finds one. Sylvia, I think, little mousy thing, trembling and all but silent until they go to work on her. Then, pleas in German and fractured English, promises, promises, everything from love to her own slavery, silenced only by her meat and blood, by whatever they force down her stretched wide throat. What's left? A butcher's sculpture, a shapeless mass of ragged, deep red meat, the only sustenance 
all we have. The fingers of the hungriest, those driven almost mad with starvation, already burrowing deep, tearing away strips and knots, sobbing, gagging as they eat. The butcher helps, hacking at her, squealing delight, feeding them what it carves away with parental delicacy, cooing its encouragement as they draw closer, naked children, grateful for this moment of love amidst the tempest of abuse. The other two, more considered, more delicate in their work, drifting amongst the squalid, the strung up, the naked, the flayed, the slit and suspended, those nailed to the walls, impaled on pulsing engines, the cowering, muttering and mutilated, all still living, impossible though it seems. Delicate caresses, but more than enough to set them clamouring, those still capable of doing so, as for those that can't, silently suffering, shivering in their chains on their spits and spikes. They see, they know, my friend screaming at their attention, begging, pleading with them to make him the same, to set him up amongst the others, to cut me out. No. Oh no, sweetheart. Not the game. The butcher finds us first, staggering away from Sylvia, heaving, unsteadied, unsteadied by its exertions. Eyes gleaming behind its mask, the eyes of one in love. I feel it, the affection, the lust. I've seen what it stirs at its crotch at work already, a flower of flesh and fractured metal, of dog's teeth, of drill bits, the trauma it can wreak on its lovers from outside and in. The other two, the surgeons, too lost in their work, otherwise they might have wandered away until they've had a chance to taste for themselves. Christ, the stink of it. Enough to turn my friend's stomach. Not me. It's a child, an adolescent, rank with the racing of its own hormones, idiot attempts at seduction, so ridiculous, so naive. I look up, staring into its eyes, at the mouth behind the mask, lips peeled back and pinned, teeth permanently exposed, a tongue protruding, elaborately scarred and pierced, licking over the leather, grunts, a pig scenting truffles. Its butcher's blade falls, its fused together fist tearing open like a placental sack, something flowering before its term, the instrument clattering to the gore encrusted grating. An instant, a heartbeat, the blade in our hands, the thing so still as though awaiting us, inviting our violence. Only he screams, my friend, buried deep. Barely a grunt as its bloated belly parts, cleaved like butter, the serrated blade carving down and across, making a flower of it. It staggers back, the blade tearing free, clutching, staring down at itself as it spills. Black tar, octopus ink, what slopes from inside knotting and writhing, entrails of great pale worms, of pulsing, bag-bodied mollusks married to whirring machinery, devices grafted in place of what its makers tore out. It looks up at me, eyes swimming with delight, my friend screaming and screaming and screaming. The others see, their surgeries disrupted, drifting through the haze of blood, the fog of pain, calling to me, their voices shattering glass in my ears, inside my head. I wait for them, though he begs me not to. Nothing but an echo of old terror, the child that haunts my memory. As always, I will drag him, kicking and screaming, and, after the blood, after the tears, he will thank me. A reaching hand, a caress intended for our cheek. Instead, I catch it by the wrist, dragging the surgeon away from its sibling, its sighs waxing to mournful squeals as I take its head and smash it against the rent and ruptured wall, again and again. It shudders, limbs flailing like a spider's, a faint trilling from somewhere inside its split and seeping anatomy, the smears it leaves against the shredded metal white as milk, clattering fragments as though it is filled with broken mirror or ill-cut clockwork, glittering, winged things taking flight, filling the air with their ragged edges, their bloody trails. The others, the ones who woke here with me, strung up, cowering, naked and bleeding, scream, shrieking for me to stop, to shield them. I can't. I won't.
feet. The swarm's already upon them, severing arteries, rupturing eyes, slicing them open, so deep, so deep. My playmate's brother drifts, eyes on us both, its smile delirious. I smile with it, waiting. It doesn't come, doesn't try to save its twin, skimming slowly towards the door. Oh no, oh no, my love. Too fast, too fast by far, reaching not with hands and fingers, but thought. He knows, my friend, the ghost of who I was, has always known, somewhere deep, denied, the capacities that he's never exercised, that he's never dared contemplate for fear of being condemned, of being called mad, the same that opened the way to the wastes beyond these walls, that he calls the forgetting that fermented me in the depths, the mires, where forbidden longings and sublimated, and sublimated fantasies linger, withering or swelling, growing fat in incestuous rape and cannibal consummation, my cradle, my womb. Lashes of pure intent, snaring around the surgeon's throat, dragging it back through the storm of red and silver butterflies erupting from its sibling's shattered body. So fragile. So fragile, futile, a voice in our head, rending apart thought, that of a child, singing through a, th a throat full of blood and bone shards. What? I can't hear. This is futile. We are forever. You cannot. I tighten my hold, pearlescent milk bleeding from where my lash breaks its skin. Perhaps... Or perhaps that's what you were sent to us. That's why you were sent to us, so your master can see what we're capable of. I turn my eyes to the ceiling, to the living fixtures that dangle and twitch there, the unseen eyes that blossom amongst them. I hope you're paying attention. Then I go to work, coaxing such songs as even these ragged angels have never sung. um so many that it became bizarrely intimidating um and it was while writing the stories and uh, as, as nick kept producing the images and as i um as i kept pouring through them i started to notice that there was there seemed to be a pattern there seemed to be a sort of thematic flavor that was consistent throughout both the images and the stories themes of Themes of birth, themes of birth and of what a profound trauma it is. What a, how it is the very first trauma that most of us ever experience. And it is the one that resonates down our entire lives, consciously or unconsciously. It informs every decision. It underlies every emotion and thought. Um, and that, that train of thought spiraled out into a, a very significant pattern of looking at mental illness, at depression, at the underlying factors that inform our subconscious and how we operate with reference to them all the time, even though we don't know we do. Um, So we came up with this notion. I think it was Nick who came up with the, uh, the the title of "Born in Blood," which is the it sets out the themes of the collection of the the stories and the images, um, which is that we are all ineluctably thrust into this state of trauma in our first waking moments. It is the first thing we know of existence outside of the womb. Um, it is pain and confusion and suffering and torment, um, you know, gasping for the first breath, um, bullied into taking it in certain, I mean, even, even abused into taking it in certain respects, you know, um, completely choking on our own mother's filth. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating and extremely dark, um, 
almost misanthropic notion the fact that the the notion that we are all in fact victims that we are all in fact victims of a an abuse that's built into our species it's something we cannot escape because it's how we are it's how we procreate there is the only potential solution is for is for is if technology or some sort of genetic modification occurs that allows us to be without being born what we grow accustomed to what we can endure the days bleed into one another as we do hurt defining every moment no more now all instants are one pulsing brilliant ecstasy and agony rendered down experienced in a heartbeat every shame every sorrow humanity history this is what we are the god we gave birth to better yes yes now we all suffer the same no more divisions no privilege or powerlessness we are the same sexless skinless exsanguine and we celebrate content in our disgrace um, which would fundamentally change the nature of humanity in certain respects it's um it's a dark concept it's a dark notion it's a dark train of thought it has certain elements of antinatalism to it although that's not a a philosophy i entirely subscribe to there are nuances within it that tend to be um that tend to be overlooked or dismissed out of hand without due consideration um because if you stop to think about it objectively then conceiving and giving birth to a child a new human being a consciousness is a profound imposition in many many respects it's in traditional ideologies and mythologies like abrahamic mythologies for example it's treated as a wonderful thing it's treated as though you're doing the new child a favor by bringing it into being which i find to be patently false i find it to be patently false the child does not ask to be you know that no child asks to be no entity asks to be conscious um especially when you consider that the the very the very fact of being a conscious entity within what we currently perceive as reality is to suffer it's to operate with un under certain limitations um and to acknowledge that any consciousness that exists or is allowed to be will inevitably experience confusion and loss and uncertainty and anxiety and pain um these experiences and these states are tied up ineluctably with being conscious they are in fact parts of it pain black pulsing the world tears wide truth chewing ravaging his flesh white through the black followed by red oh filthy filthy beast lucifer's own shite he lashes out blind again and again but she has battened on him like a bulldog teeth tearing deeper deeper an error he sees that now not one he might save the devil's own sent to disrupt his work through the blindness the pain he prays begging release no answer the thing somehow blocking his connection to the divine bitch he screams the already saved stirring writhing in their bonds and blood vile bitch blow after blow not enough to dislodge her even as she splits and bleeds as her skull shatters the cut thread she falls away taking him with her the father staggers back going to his knees in the dirt all of them stirring now chains rattling slurring swinish nonsense rising she spits his flesh from between her lips what was once blessed flopping limp and mangled in the dirt um components of the same phenomena and in that regard giving conceiving and giving birth to a child is not a uniquely wonderful thing it is not a boon it's in fact an imposition um and it's a remarkably dark train of thought 
it's a remarkably dark train of thought because there could potentially be an extinctionist argument, certainly a, a misanthropic perspective cultivated by it. Um, what it acknowledges or what it suggests, whether it's true or not, or whether it can be, fa it can be um, factually ratified, is that we are all traumatised. We're all fundamentally traumatised entities that are attempting to make sense of the unspoken traumas that we experience with every waking instant, every waking and dreaming instant, because those traumas also inform our dreams and our imaginative lives too. Um, they inform our mythologies. Our, our traditional mythologies are replete with them. I mean, if you just look at Abrahamic mythology as an example, you have so much imagery referring to universal human drives and concerns within Genesis, within Revelations, within the notion of original sin and all that stuff. It's really interesting. It's really fascinating to me that our collective um, structures and ideologies can function as mediums of expression and exploration for these almost fundamentally inalienably human concepts. I find that fascinating. Never long enough, the world always returning in its blood-tasting, spit-burning stupidity, its shit, its pointlessness. They didn't know, the ones who came, who sensed his strangeness. Other now, so utterly transformed from the boy he was, it had begun to seem almost like a nightmare of life, a fantasy to occupy, swelling thought before ejection from the womb. But they came, nonetheless, wolf scenting blood or sickness, making up any excuse, often not even bothering, before blows flew, bruises swelling, other broken things, other wounded, that his father would no doubt have loved, girls as well as boys, the former often retreating in shock when he fought back as furiously as against any of his own sex. So much trouble, so many talks and isolations, so many idiot questions, letters home, idle punishments that were no punishment at all. He didn't need what they needed, didn't want what they wanted, and that terrified them. All of them. This one, Natalie Holstock, a big girl, not fat, but tall and stocky, more so than most of the boys in his year. She saw it instantly, just as he saw it in her. The wound, the bleeding. Nothing that others could see or smell, not in any way they might define, but there. She loved him for it, hated him for it, endlessly harassed, endlessly shrieked and spat insults at him from across the schoolyard. Naked to him, so, so ashamed, his wretchedness reflecting hers, a walking mirror of what she most reviled in herself. That first violence, he'd never forget it. A boil finally bursting, a babe crowning, relief coming with the blood and bruises, albeit temporarily. More. The split lip, the bruised eye. Not enough. He wanted to taste, to spit blood and shattered teeth, to feel ribs splinter and grate against one another, for his skull to shatter and spill the storm inside. He'd not let her walk away, not even when she started screaming, dragged her back by her hair, hissing through the blood. Um, and from that, I, came, I started to write stories in which... Characters not only experienced these extreme states of trauma, both physical and mental, but started to find some poetry and purpose in it. They started to make a mythology out of it, some sense of meaning. And then I, I came up with an overarching notion, which is that there is a metaphysical state, a condition that is neither real nor entirely imaginary, which is formed from our collective trauma and from our expressions and analyses of it. Um, a condition called avarice, which is probably the darkest thing I've ever conceived of. Um, in terms of imagery, 
there's a lot it borrows a lot from certain fictional mythologies there's an element there's definitely an element of the lovecraftian to it there is an abrahamic influence underlying it but there's also references to um video game and comic book mythologies um there's a hieronymus bosch and hr giga element going on to it in terms of its aesthetics certainly um it pays certain homage to um a concept that occurs in uh, uh, an old video game, a relatively old video game, one of my favourites now, which is largely forgotten, um, Shadow Man from the uh, the early 32-bit era, which has this wonderfully nihilistic and moribund metaphysics to it, um, in which everybody goes to the same place when they die, without exception. It doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you... Um, what you do, it doesn't matter how you act, there's no moral dimension to it, you all go to the same place, and this place is awful. It's hideous. It is, um, as the Shadow Man himself puts it, the asshole of the universe. It is a, a wasteland. It's a metaphysical wasteland. And in that wasteland is a structure called the Asylum. Um, and the Asylum is... It's kind of one part Victorian insane asylum to another part bizarre, horrific surgery to a, another nursery. It's a, it's just a very weird and bizarre concept. And those elements and images all went into making Aberice. Aberice incorporates a lot of those notions and then goes deeper with them. Uh, it it's it explores them in minute detail um so what the book provides it, it, it's a collection of short stories uh, some of which are longer than others but which are interlinked by an overarching narrative and an overarching mythology which resolves to a certain degree um, there is a running narrative throughout the entire collection which is tied up to a degree in the last story um it's a metaphysics that is not entirely despairing despite what its constituents um might suggest it's not entirely despairing there is something to be said for the mythology for the the state of being that it provides there is a uh, an element of Hellraiser as well in this. I mean, Leviathan's Hell in the Hellraiser mythologies is something that has always snared my imagination, but which I don't think they go far enough with. Which is one of my, which was definitely one of my motivating factors for this. I wanted to take a concept a little like that, where there is poetry and purpose and even metaphysics in extreme suffering in mutilation and pain and despair but which can become a cause of celebration which can lend a certain degree of meaning and poetry to one's existence and become something that one aspires to or a state of extremity that one wishes to explore born to cancer Born to mutilation, a universe slowly bleeding out, shriveling around them, the angels wanted him to see, charged his father to make the means, only he could, and attuned a mind, a blood that sang at particular pitch and frequency, a hereditary influence that they scented, that they heard like music, in him now their ecstasy at his presence trembling throughout their bodies through the fingers that they reached inside that they sliced and plucked and reconfigured him with pain pain unlike anything blinding white black and pulsing seeping red a continuation of the same symphony they would inspired when they sang to his father when they called to the children who had been born of the blood the same that the engine required that others had seeded throughout humanity in various lines and legacies pain that transformed transcended redefined Sander, the boy of that name, scrubbed clean, to the bone and beyond. No screams, no expression anatomy could make, pain that only one whose blood carried echoes of ancient agonies could endure. Uh, 
I find that really interesting. I, I don't think the the Hellraiser stories go far enough with it myself, um, and they're not ambiguous enough with it. It's always presented as a negative thing or something to be escaped from or defeated, which is it's not necessarily something that interests me. I'm interested in why it's attractive. I'm interested in why humanity would return to that concept, to that notion again and again and again. Why we gnaw over old bones, why our, our minds automatically turn to the traumas, to the disappointments, to the disgraces, to the dark places um, that we would rather be sublimated, uh, that we would rather forget. Why they return to them and obsess over them again and again and again and again. Why it becomes almost fetishistic. And how that exploration, that self-autopsy can be refined and become a means of self, self-recreation. It's, about, it's not only about exploring the trauma of birth. It's about, and all the traumas that follow, it's about acknowledging them and comprehending them to such a degree that we can escape them that we can escape the impositions that derive from them and recreate ourselves, metaphorically or otherwise. I mean, it happens quite physically in the short stories, but metaphorically, that's what I was really trying to look at in this collection. And it's it's been an obsessive thing. It really has. It's been entirely obsessive. Um, I haven't worked on anything as hard or as deeply as I have this collection, because for one thing, I wanted it to be better than Strange Playgrounds. I mean, you know, inevitably, you know, Strange Playgrounds was a collection that's of its time. It, it, it was written by a particular version of me, actually particular versions of me that don't exist anymore. That guy, that child, really, that kid is dead in a very real sense. Um, and I'm sat here in his place. Um, I'm a different entity now, and I probably wouldn't write the stories in Strange Playgrounds, or stories like those that I write, wrote in Strange Playgrounds anymore. I just wouldn't, <clears throat> because they've already expressed what they need to express, and catharsis has occurred. The person who wrote them has gone through those experiences, has dealt with those concepts, and has hopefully moved on a little bit, and that's another thing that born in blood represents it's an entirely personal thing um also it's been just on a, a technical level it's been really fun um working with someone else working in conjunction with someone else and having another set of eyes another another mind another imagination to bring their notions and their ideas and their interpretations to the material that's been great that's been a really wonderful thing and i, I would love to do it again um, I would love to collaborate in some other way, in some other medium. I mean, for one thing, I, I've always wanted to write a video game. Um, always. And now with, with independent video gaming as, as open as it is, that's uh, entirely possible. It's entirely possible. I mean, people can program video games from their bedrooms again, like they used to be able to in the 1980s with the Sinclair Spectrum and the Commodore Amiga and the C64. It's entirely possible now. That is a medium I would love love to break into in one way shape or form but yes that is what born in blood is going to consist of it's um it has been an extremely immersing often all-consuming project and uh, it has got to a point it did get to a point where i had to pause work on it for a little bit because it was affecting my state of mind the stories are so dark they're so extreme. They, they're so nihilistic. They explore such depths of human trauma um, that I had to stop because they were evoking some old problems of my own, you know, sort of old traumas and old neuroses that I was I hoped were gone at that point they started to evoke some of those and that and give i started to feel like the creeping anxiety of them again so i had to put it away for a little bit <clears throat> but fortunately um it is done now it is ready and will be released very soon the way it's um the way it's going to work is that there's going to be a series of volumes 
um, which Nick has put together, Nick has composed these, which will incorporate my short stories and extracts of the longer stories where, alongside Nick's visual work, alongside the photographs he's created. Um, any money that Nick or I would potentially make from these volumes is going to go to a mental health charity, uh, minus production costs, obviously. Um, and alongside that, we're also going to publish the short story collection, um, it, hopefully both in, as a paperback and as um, a an, in electronic format. So there'll be that too. Um, if you want to get the full short story collection before the volumes themselves have been released, I mean, ideally it'd be great if you'd buy them both all. You know, they're going to be I think six volumes all in all. Um, and honestly, having seen the work Nick has done. Um, I, I cannot, I could not possibly be prouder to be part of a project. He has created something so exquisitely beautiful. So beautiful. I mean, traumatic and affecting and powerful. Um, he's created something that I would be very proud to have up there on my bookshelves alongside my, my art books of... Barker and Dali and Giga and all that kind of thing. I, I mean, it's okay. it's and uh, to be part of that is wonderful. To be part of that is absolutely exquisite. Um, <clears throat> so yes, if you like your fiction and your art, extreme and intense and fairly triggering, it has to be said. I think you'll get something out of this. It's not for everyone. I mean, if, if you happen to be a little bit of a sensitive soul, then I'd steer clear of it. Um, but otherwise, I sincerely hope that you'll have a look and that you get something out of it, that it does something to your state of mind for better or for worse. Um, there's really nothing more that I could ever possibly want than for it to change your states of mind in some way, shape or form. Thank you.